Welcome everyone to the Frinks Movement Podcast. It is still hard to believe I'm saying it, but today's guest is none other than Dr. Mike Isretel, the PhD in sports physiology and co-founder of Renaissance Periodization, the author of scientific articles and highly influential books that are the foundation of many people's approach to training and coaching. I've been binge-watching and listening on videos and podcasts with Mike for years, which makes his appearance in the show even more special to me. I honestly never heard of Mike addressing Cal's Calisthenics topics apart from sporadic Q&As, so I really did not know what to expect. Programming periodization for street lifting. Yo, motherfucker, we in the streets. Am I? Am I? <laughs> I asked Mike about his perspective on many issues bodyweight athletes face regarding programming, body composition, or training methods. The conversation got really fluid, and I can honestly encourage you all to listen to the whole thing. I made a decision not to kick you off the podcast yet. I'm trying to get kicked off. It's not working. But as always, I provide you with timestamps so you can choose the most interesting and applicable part for you. Enjoy! Hello and welcome everyone to the Frinks Movement Podcast. Uh, Today we have a very, very special episode. Uh, My guest is Dr. Mike Isretel. Hello Mike, what's up? Hey, good being on the show. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so I have to say I'm pretty positively surprised that you agreed to um, to take part in this podcast. Uh, it was honestly one of my future, very future, long-term goals to uh, to have someone like you on this podcast. And I believe it's a big opportunity for calisthenics to learn something uh, from someone as high as you are in terms of sports science, and um, to finally, you know, like get some ideas that are actually proven and that are actually used in in the modern uh, strength training so really appreciate it i just wanted to say that again thank you so much man thanks for having me on it's it's a pleasure um so yeah so um today i just wanted to go about certain things regarding the calisthenics and before i'm gonna Uh, jump into the topics and the little introduction in terms of what is calisthenics and what we are going to be talking about. Uh, I would like you to have a small introduction in case, you know, like someone is not aware uh, of uh, who you are and uh, what your of your work, uh, basically, because, you know, people from calisthenics, maybe it's a bit different background, maybe people are not aware. So it's good uh, that if you could uh, briefly intro- introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. So, um, Dr. Mike Isretel, I have a PhD in sport physiology, which is the science of taking good athletes and making them better. And I uh, taught at a bunch of places. I'm now a professor at Lehman College in New York City. Um, and I teach under Brad Schoenfeld's master's program for exercise science. And my specialty is uh, essentially strength and muscle growth enhancement. And I also helped to found and co-run a big company in fitness called Renaissance Periodization. And in my own free time, so to speak, I trained for competitive bodybuilding and competitive Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappling. So that's, that's okay. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah. So have you ever heard of calisthenics uh, in any of the context? I actually have a gunshot wound from losing a calisthenics street battle. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Um, yeah, so I mean, to be honest, the, the I grew up, part of my childhood was spent in Russia until I was seven. And in Russia, calisthenics was the primary form of sort of government recommended exercise. Uh, a lot of people did calisthenics in some way or another. It's it called Zeratka is what it was called in Russian. So, um, and then, you know, a lot of like growing up, you don't really have access to gym equipment. So you kind of see how many pull-ups you can do, push-ups, and always friends are curious and get together. And of course, with the advent of YouTube, we got to see some of the best in the world doing their own versions. And that was always very inspiring. And so I was always kind of aware of that as I pursued the gym lifting component. Um, I've interacted with plenty of people. I've trained some folks and given recommendations to people. And I've seen some people who are uh, basically like trying to be as good at calisthenics as possible. I get it. So, um, so I'm actually very positively surprised about it uh, that calisthenics is also, you know, being uh, somewhat known in different circles. Um, so the context 
of um, usually it's considered a bodyweight exercise, which is true. Uh, obviously, it has its different, you know, different uh, kind of like sub disciplines. One of them is street lifting, uh, which is uh, like the funny name for basically a powerlifting competition where there is no deadlift and bench press. We have pull up and dip and sometimes the muscle up. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, what I'm going to be talking about and referring to as calisthenics is the sport where the performance is dictated by the relative strength of the athlete. So the pound for pound strength or body or strength to body weight ratio is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and yeah, and I think that uh, with this uh, introduction, with this having in, in, in our minds, we can we can get to uh, to the next point, to the next question. First question, actually, which is going to be the body composition in calisthenics and in relative strength sports. So the first thing I would like to ask you, Mike, is uh, do you think that there is certain optimal, if we can call it, uh, level or threshold of body fat percentage that uh, would be the best for performance in terms of relative strength and yes, pound for parts, pound for pound strength. Yes, and that that actually is not as much of a threshold as it is is more of a, a distinct grouping of values that's pretty tightly clustered. You can find your own distinct grouping of values for body composition by just considering a few things. One uh, sort of constraint number one is the less body fat you can have, barring other side effects, the better. So if you, let's say, perform quite well at 20% body fat, and you ask yourself, should I get down to 15% body fat? It is certainly a question that doesn't get answered no right away. There's definitely something to it, right? Like if you, you know, pick a really delicious fruit off of a tree, you eat it and it's amazing, and there's another fruit that looks just like it, should you try that one too? Oh well, yeah, probably, right? So it's not like, oh, maybe it's completely different. No, there's something to be said there biomechanically the less excess tissue you have that doesn't itself produce force the better so in a sense if you were to make a machine that did calisthenics it would have zero percent body fat now there's the other constraints come in um one of them is so essentially probably the most important is how is your training feeling because at a certain leanness whether it be the leanness itself or more often the kind of diet and cardio and everything that it, fatiguing elements that it takes to maintain that leanness or get to it, tends to interfere with your training quality. So you used to be able to just do dips and pull-ups and all these other things. And when you got to like 7% body fat, your shoulders and elbows started acting up and you're just really tired. And all of a sudden you're not getting the same results you used to and you're actually not stronger, uh, pound for pound, or for sure absolutely stronger. And then it just becomes not worth the trade-off. So I would say, so for folks interested in calisthenics, they should experiment with pushing their body fat at some point in their career, lower and lower, until they get a de dependable repeating pattern of every time they get this lean, whatever that is, um, then my training quality suffers and my performance starts to suffer as well. And uh, generally that will occur somewhere between 6 and 10% for most calisthenic athletes, unless they have genetics to be fatter and it takes them a lot of work to get to that 10%. And then that work itself can be so fatiguing, it doesn't quite make sense. And then they can stay at a higher body fat because for them, that's where they get performance. That's the best. So at the end of the day, the best performance is absolutely the only thing anyone cares about. But from a theoretical perspective, you got to try to see if lowering your body fat will reduce your performance. And you probably know, as, as many people do, on body weight stuff, if you lose fat, you feel it right away. And it gives yeah. you a big benefit in performance. So only at pretty exotically lean levels does that benefit no longer transfer. And you can get there. If you're below 6% body fat, maybe, yeah, I'd love to be good at pull-ups, but everything hurts and I'm really tired. And at that point, you're just not in a training environment that's conducive to, to long-term success. Yeah, actually, a very good point with... Uh these two aspects so kind of like the performance and uh, the weight of your like the, the body weight um, so the thing is if we look at like the longer term long long let's say the mesocycle of training probably if we would like to compete or do like one time show then uh, what you're saying is then the lowest body body fat would be probably the best for that one show if we can 
Maybe, okay. maybe it depends on how you feel that day. You know, if it took you an unbelievable amount of fatiguing exercise and fatiguing diet restriction and sleep problems to get to 5% fat, you may not be in a competitive state on the day of the show. You may be too fatigued to compete at your best. You know, you do high rep pull-ups and after rep number 20, you just, <gasps> you're tired. You don't know why. Well, so you don't have any damn body fat. Your body's dying on you. Like if you ever see how bodybuilders train close to the show, they're very lean. They do not have a high level of performance. So there's a middle ground there where too little body fat can actually affect acute performance as well. So this should be done slowly. It should be like you're averaging 12% fat, let's say. You do a little bit of a diet, a little cleanup to get down to 10%. Train and eat and see how you feel. And if you're like, man, everything just got better and I don't have any downsides, try 8% next. Take two months to get to 8%. See how you feel. If at 8% you're like, I don't know, my joints kind of feel weird and I feel like I just don't have a lot of energy and my performance is like similar to what it was at 10%. Some things are up, some things are down then maybe don't go any lower and see if you can go back up to 10% and get a boost. Because sometimes you go up to 10% and you're like, oh my God, I'm so strong and you hit all your PRs. And then all of a sudden, you maybe you can go back to eight later and see if you have a better run at it. But this is why I said in the early description, a repeated attempt. So you go to eight three times and all three times the shit kind of starts to suck. You sure as hell shouldn't go to six because you know where that's going to lead. It's like putting your finger up close to a fire and the fire's this far away. You're like, ow. Oh, it's a stupid idea to be like, ah, like you already know. So, you know, just go little by little and see where your best performance tends to happen. So if we actually want to uh, make traditional bulking and cutting, and we are also introducing some sort of periodization in terms of our training. So we are, for example, going through the hypertrophy phase. Uh, for a couple of cycles, you know, two to three cycles, then strength, and then let's say like skill cycle, very specific for calisthenics athletes. Uh, how would you schedule the the body in terms of body composition? How would you schedule the bulking and cutting if we know that we should not change our body composition as much during strength phase, but at the same time in calisthenics is highly related to it, right? So sure. would it make sense to actually do cutting during your strength phase? Or should we just, you know, because most people won't be doing the skill phase. It's worth to to note. Uh, most people will just go hypertrophy strength. Most people don't compete, don't need to do any peaking sort of, you know. So I would like you to, to hear the ta your take on that. So generally speaking, in strength training, you want a real stable environment so you can have the nervous system and architectural changes take place as unimpeded as possible. And uh, that, in addition to that, hypertrophy training provides enough volume to make sure you don't lose any muscle on your way down to a certain body fat. So if you're interested in getting leaner, I would do that during a hypertrophy phase, get to a certain level of leanness, then you start your strength phase, just aim to maintain that level of leanness, okay. which does two things. One, it allows you to get leaner during hypertrophy, which saves your muscle. And two, it allows you a real good two months of testing your strength and trying to improve your strength at we'll say 8% or something. And if that really works out well, then you know it was a sustainable body fat. If you just drop fat to peak for a competition and the competition doesn't go well, maybe it's because you were leaner, maybe it's because you just had a bad competition or 50 other things. But if you get lean or as lean as you want, or you bulk up and get bigger, if you stay dur there during that strength phase, really becomes apparent if that's a beneficial place for you to stay. So the alternate example for getting lean is putting on muscle. Let's say you weigh 70 kilos and you're like, you know, I need a bigger back and bigger triceps. I need to get up to 75 kilos. Let's say you get up to 75 kilos. One of two things may happen when you're staying there during a strength phase. One is, first of all, you built a lot of muscle, so it's time to test out whether that muscle does anything. And two, it's time to see if that extra body fat and body weight actually affect you positively or negatively. It could go, there's a spectrum, of course, right? But the middle cutoff of the spectrum up and down is, uh, on the one hand, you could be like at 75 and at first everything kind of feels weird, but then your strength starts to pick up, your joints feel great, your training energy is insane. And all of a sudden at the end of that two month period of strength, you're just hitting all kinds of PRs, number of dips, pull-ups, weights, etc. And you're like, fuck, that was the greatest decision I've ever made. And the other one could be like, oh, you know, like, it's really quite similar or actually I'm not hitting PRs. And then of course there's a more complex answer there is that once you get up to 75, you may be able to retain quite a bit of the muscle you put on 
and then come back to 72.5 or 70 or 71. And then on your way back down, you can do that another during another hypertrophy phase or even potentially during a strength phase. But after you get there, you should have another strength phase after to really get in good high quality training to see if that's where you want to be. Okay. Okay. I understand. Um, so, yeah. So, so as we have that, would you say that there is a threshold where in calisthenics, I guess, uh, there is a point we should there is basically too too much muscle uh, so that we should maybe there is a, a point when building more muscle will be actually detrimental given how much work we have to put into that and specify you know in terms of building muscle uh, so maybe there is a point we, where we should just focus on building strength uh, in say let's say four to you know six rep range three to six rep range and just continue like that all the time uh, because it's no point to do hypertrophy phases. Yeah, for sure. And uh, that's another thing that people just need to explore, um, which is why staying the same, especially in the intermediate years of your calisthenics career, is not a good idea. So if you're a beginner, it's pretty easy. You just do calisthenics, you get stronger, you get bigger, all at the same time everything happens. As an intermediate, you may be interested in progressively moving your body weight up uh, and seeing where actually the relative strength gains stop and then de decreasing your body weight, losing some fat, trying to come back up, decreasing, come back up. It just takes years, obviously. After years of cycling like that, you're going to note when you are simultaneously too skinny to have your best performance or too big to have your best performance. And you can say, you know, it really looks like at about 73 kilos is where I have the best combination of the muscle to power the movement mm -hmm. and the lack of excess body weight to slow the movement down. And that's where you're going to hit the, ver the majority of your PRs. One absolutely essential thing for calisthenic athletes is the following. Every fucking time you hit a PR, step on the scale and write down your body weight. That is indispensable information because a lot of people in calisthenics think through shit a lot of people don't and they'll be like man i had a big dip pr like three years ago and i've never been able to replicate it but like, how much did you weigh They're like i don't know man i think like 73 but like what do you weigh now they're like yeah maybe like 80 what's well, like, oh, no shit maybe you should drop some weight they start dropping weight and all of a sudden the prs come back so strength it's a strength to body weight sport you should be profoundly intimately familiar not just with your body weight in general but on the days that you hit your best movements because when you show up to a competition or if you want to hit a big PR, you should titrate your body weight even with fluid consumption in such a way that comes the closest to your most reliable body weight. So for example, say you have tons of weighted dip PRs and rep PRs in the dips and you're like, pretty much 90% of these PRs occur between 73 and 75 kilos when I weigh, right? And you show up to a competition, you step on the scale, you're 77. You're in a bad place because the probability you're hitting a PR is low. It's not zero, but it's low, right? So you have to know your body weight almost all the time. And through experimentation, you will find where you have your best strength to weight ratio. And it's a, it's, here's the thing. There's a different number for everybody. Even based on the relationship between your limb lengths, you could have a different one. Your frame size, some people have bigger frames. They just need more muscle and can put more of it on. And it makes them mechanically more advantaged the more they put on until a high point. If you have a really small frame, you know, you take like like a tiny Korean calisthenics guy, he's not going to weigh 75 kilos. He's going to weigh 65. And if you try to bulk him to 75, his leverages get all off and everything goes to hell. So I think a lot of people probably, if the calisthenics community is anything like the lifting community, uh, which it probably is, there's probably tons of people on calisthenic forums being like, how much should I weigh? And it's like, well, that matters. Your height, your limb ratios, your frame, your genetics. So it's something that if you train calisthenics hard, make sure to wave your body weight slowly up and down, record all your PRs. It's like, where am I really doing my best? Now, it can change over time. You, as you build more muscle, you could have been your best at 55 kilos and then eventually that that 90% of all your PRs margin shifts to 60 and then 65. Just, you know, the most recent values are obviously the most important, but just know where they are so you're not lying to yourself. In lifting, a lot of times there's an, you know, because lifting is absolute. So how much you bench press is just a big number. And the more weight you gain, the more you bench press. The more weight you gain, the more you squat. The more weight you gain to a point, the more you deadlift. So there's really like just getting bigger is always kind of a correct answer. In calisthenics, it's absolutely not the case. And you have to be very aware of that body weight and, and respect it. So a lot of people are like, 
you know, it's like, oh my God, calisthenics, it's using muscle to propel your body. I'm just going to go in a gain phase and gain a shitload of muscle and they get upset that their lifts don't go well. You have the opposite problem where people just try to stay skinny as long as possible and they don't have a ton of muscle. And someone's like, have you ever tried lifting and gaining muscle? They're like, yeah, every time I gain weight, I get worse. It's like, well, yeah, temporarily you might get worse, but over the long term, as you build muscle and strength, months later, you might be about the same and then you lose that excess fat and you used to be 60 kilos, now you're 65 and you're hitting your all time best PRs. So some of that cyclicity is going to make you better over the long term. Basically, my big point here is in calisthenics, don't get complacent. Don't just assume your body weight's going to be whatever. Don't assume you're at the optimal body weight until you have good data to back that up. So if someone was to come to me from calisthenic sport and say, hey, should I gain weight or lose weight? I say, let me see all of your PRs for the last year with your body weights next to them. And if they can't get me that data, I have nothing to tell you because I have no idea. Thank you for the very comprehensive answer. Um, I honestly uh, thought, I, I knew that it's quite a complex topic, but you you explained it really well. Um, so That's what you get uh, for inviting a sports scientist on your show. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, so so I appreciate every single minute. Uh, so, so I wanted to now kind of move on from the body composition side uh, to more of periodization and training side. And specifically now talking about the skills. So I send you a couple of images of commonly done skills. You've probably been familiar with them before uh, since they're pretty popular. Um, so let's say a person wants to learn, his goal is learning a planche. So this straight arm, you know, like pushing skill, uh, mostly involving shoulders, uh, chest, stuff like that. Okay, so he, he goes and he tries to periodize, he tries to plan his cycles, his training. And he goes, he plans his strength phase, uh, sorry, his hypertrophy phase, then strength phase, and then maybe going for, let's say, one cycle of skill to, to test stuff out, to put more time into technique, practice, stuff like that. So pretty normal. Uh, how would you go about uh, managing the specificity of the sport and of this skill, which is pretty specific, uh, in the hypertrophy phase? So uh, before before you can be, before you start, I wanted to just explain a few things. So the the moves in calisthenics have pretty terrible um, stimulus to fatigue ratio. You would call sure. it when it comes to building muscle. So you won't build like tons of muscle by only doing planche uh, because your tendons, your joints will be the limiting factor before that, right? Uh, so that's the first point. The second point, they're pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to modify the intensity in them. Uh, in t you can do that, but it's pretty, it's not objective uh, usually. And third thing is that uh, in terms of skills like the planche, uh, you very often, work with uh, isometrics, static holds, which are also not the best tool for building muscle. So the thing is, there are three options to go about things. One thing would be to totally screw the specificity in the hypertrophy phase and just go with, you know, overhead presses, uh, exercises that are just meant to be, uh, to be for the hypertrophy and building muscle that have the best stimulus to, uh, sorry, stimulus to fatigue ratio. Um, the second would be to introduce some sort of specificity before the hypertrophy session. So, for example, someone goes to your uh, to the gym and performs a couple of holds, a couple of skills, and then goes to normal training. The third would be uh, using the specific exercises, variations, uh, specifically to target higher rep ranges. So, for example, do like straight arm presses, you know, with uh, dumbbells and imitating the planche uh, in doing, let's say, 15 reps like that. Uh, so these are kind of three ways. What is your take on that? What would you be, what would you prescribe the athlete like that? Yeah. So it's option three we can just throw away because that's absolutely the worst option. But uh, I have a little a bit more sports science insight. So okay. there is an illusion that it occurs through an attempt to oversimplify periodization that periodization is composed necessarily of unique cycles that are mutually exclusive in training modality. So for two months you do only hypertrophy, for two months you do only strength, and for the last month you do only technique. The best way to go about modern periodization is to have a total fraction of training and subfractions of it split to any one of those three things. And 
in a sport like calisthenics, you always want some of those around, or maybe not always, 90 something percent of the time, your program in any given week is going to have hypertrophy elements, it's going to have strength elements, and it's going to have technical elements. So what you want to do, it, 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 this answer a little bit depends on if you're working with a more advanced individual or a beginner. Uh, which one would you like me to tailor this to? So I would like to go about a more advanced athlete because sure. I, yes, just sure, let's sure. go with more advanced athlete, yeah. So advanced athlete already can do all the positions for quite some time and they know all the positions and stuff like that. But what they're going to notice is they can use a little bit of technical work on specific aspects of the position. Let's say, you know, like my shoulders feel great. I never give out of my shoulders. It's always my wrists that feel kind of weird. And I, I, I don't know if I should be putting my hands here. I've had a little bit more success putting them here. I'm not 100% sure. So for them, in the hypertrophy phase, they do mostly hypertrophy work targeted to the muscles that require enlarging. Okay, and that's the stimulus to fatigue ratio is the big consideration there. Also some specificity, if a muscle, if, if a, a lift like this has a good stimulus to fatigue ratio for you, it's totally great because it's specific and uh, has a good SFR. What you don't want to do is do this and be like, oh, my shoulders, my shoulders, my shoulders, this sucks, where you could have just been doing bench presses and getting most of that stuff. So you still, so you do mostly of that hypertrophy work. You're going to have some times where you put a little bit more weight on the bar and do some strength work, maybe the minority of it. And during that hypertrophy phase, you're still going to have a fundamental practice of the positions. Not maximally, not to their limit, but you're going to take the positions, you're going to hold them for some time that's not super challenging, but is a little bit like, oh, okay, this took a little work. And during that time, you as an advanced athlete, you're going to wiggle, whittle with a few technicalities, shoulder position, forearm position, how much chalk you put on. Uh, which way your wrists are turning, all that stuff, because you're going to try to want to find for your body the things that feel really good and work on those limiting factors. You're like, you know what? Used to be I would time out on, on my positions because my wrists and four, like hands really started to hurt. Now that I turned it out a little bit, it really isn't a limiting factor anymore. Now it's my shoulder position. And maybe you could work on put, you know, arching your back or lowering or something in a way that takes stress off your shoulders. What that does after weeks and weeks of practice, it just makes you better at the positions because you're not you're not pressured to just try to do as well as you can. You know, if you have a solid technique, if you're always pressuring to do your best, like hold the planche for as long as possible, sometimes the technical nuances get away from you. And you just, you know, you get that psychology. You're just like, oh, let's fucking do this. And you just hold it as long as possible. That's not great for learning. The hypertrophy phase takes all the pressure off of performing because you're never even going to failure at that point in your actual competition calisthenic moves. You just wiggle them a little bit to try to get them a little better work on the sort of um, limiting factors that you think, okay, if I fix this, it's going to be a real big deal because this is the thing that's always holding me back. That also applies to the how you design the hypertrophy phase. For example, if your chest and shoulders are super strong and you can take those positions no problem, but your abdominals aren't that strong and you have a hard time elevating your feet out in front of you, like you know it's your abdominals or your hip flexors, you can work more hypertrophy work for abdominals and hip flexors because they need to get bigger because later they need to get stronger. As you get into your strength phase, you do less hypertrophy work, more strength work, and now you should have a pretty good idea of the positions that you're taking. You can also do de um, derivative lifts at this point that take the part of calisthenics that's the most difficult for you and exaggerate the living shit out of it. So you may be able to use some bands or some contraptions or some machines to really exaggerate one part of it, make it super hard so that systemically it's not as hard to hold a planche, for example, but your shoulders are really feeling it. It's a very similar position, but it's more biased to like, okay, this is all on your shoulders now. It's all on your legs, so on and so forth. So you can use those during the strength phase and train them pretty hard and also, of course, practice the normal submaximal calisthenics positions during this time. And you're going to max out every now and again if you want, but not not a whole lot going on. And then once you get into your peaking phase, if you have one to prepare, you know, either for competition, but even if you don't compete, just for showing off. You know, a lot of people who are intermediates in calisthenics, the PRs just kind of come from them all the time. And they're just like, oh, I'm just training and getting stronger. At some point, even if you don't have the desire to compete against other people, 
you might be in a situation where like you haven't really hit a PR for like three or four weeks in your strength phase, and you're like, I, I want to eke out this PR. Like it, maybe you're on the precipice of like, what's an impressive number of pull-ups, 40 or something. You've gotten like 38, 39, 38, 39. You're like, okay, I want to take two or three weeks to really just fucking nail 40 because God damn it, I'm so close. Then you're really doing a peaking phase, even though you're not competing. Does that make sense? So peaking style training is important, even though those of us who don't compete, because it's for the soul. Like, you're like, God damn it, I'm so close to this number. So at that point, the peaking phase, hypertrophy work goes to very little, almost none. Strength work stays in, but gets reduced throughout as far as volume, still very high intensity. And then your practice all the actual movements escalates to the highest it's ever been. And now you're pushing each movement pretty close to where it's supposed to be. And you can actually use a combination of variables. One is you can use the regular movement itself and go longer and longer and longer or do more and more reps. Another way you can use at the same time, just different parts of the week or even in the same workout is a slightly overloaded version of the movement for as long as you can. So for example, if you're doing pull-ups, and your, your ultimate goal is to do 40 total pull-ups with your body weight. Training with 5 kilos, 10 kilos uh, weighted is an incredible assistive tool because it's pretty specific. The pull-up's going to look pretty similar, but it's a great way to overload and provide some variation. The problem with calisthenics, I'm sure you've encountered, is a lot of staleness if you're not creative. Still doing pull-ups day one, day 60, more pull-ups. You just, just add a rep every day. Like it doesn't fucking work like that when you're advanced. So if you have some pull-ups that are heavier, some pull-ups that are lighter or of your regular body weight, you can even have elements of positions in which you deload part of the position. For example, if you have, if you're holding some kind of planche or something, you can have your toes or your, or your head or whatever on like a very, very light band to help you just a little bit. And if your feet sink any lower than a certain point, you're like, okay, that was failure. That can allow you to practice the technical position without imposing a ton of fatigue on yourself because it's unloaded to some extent. So what you might have is you say you, you train calisthenics six days of the week. Three of those days might be the actual movement at its own hardest point. Two of those days of the week might be the movement overloaded to be heavier than normal. And then one of those days may be a day in the middle of the week where you take an intentional, like a little bit easier, and it's an unloaded version of that movement. So you still get the technical practice of sitting in that position, but it doesn't beat you up like crazy or require you to dip your psychology into just a whole lot of trying. So that combination is what I think modern periodization for calisthenics would ultimately look like. Okay, so uh, what you mentioned is a lot of undulation throughout the week and a lot of uh, variation in, in terms of intensity, right? Yeah, sure. I think that's the problem in calisthenics. I think that people get kind of like stuck with what they are capable of doing and they don't want to really get back to the, for example, lighter progressions, lighter things. It's just going up. It's just, you know, like the uh, this kind of tendency. And I think that's what holds back many people from actually progressing farther, because as you mentioned, uh, you can progress like that when you're a beginner, but then it kind of you, you cannot just add one rep of pull up. Uh, each sure. Day, right. Yeah. And so you, you, you actually um, tackled some points that I wanted to to get to. So I think that I'm just going to go with the plan, you know, and uh, maybe if you already mentioned something, we're going to just, you know, uh, move on with that. Um, can so I, can I say something really quick? Obviously. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So just just because you made a really excellent point about people sort of not wanting to regress back to more fundamental things like, like, look, you're really strong, but your planche actually has like one big technical error in it. And you have to fix this error, but you have to take load off to fix that error. Like you have yeah. to relearn how to tuck your hips. And some people are like, fuck it, this is just how I do it. Like, yeah, but you're doing it wrong. And if you never learn how to do it right, you're going to cap out at here where you could cap out at here, right? There's another problem I've noticed in calisthenics. People get into calisthenics for one major reason, and not everyone, but a lot of people get into this reason. It doesn't really require any equipment, right? I mean, you just fucking go to the park and just fucking do calisthenics. That, that's and that's awesome and i don't ever blame anyone for that or anything like that but i a year way beyond this point in your own career i'm sure of there's a fork in the road of do i want to do shit in the park and get as good as that will get me or do i want access to every conceivable piece of equipment that will make me even better like if you look at you know gymnastics 
you know, you don't need a whole lot of implements for gymnastics. But if you look at a professional gymnastics gym in Romania, they have like a whole weightlifting set and 10 different specialized machines. And be like, why are you guys doing that? Because it, it's that little extra benefit that that gives. But for example, people are like, I'm like, and they usually don't call it calisthenics. You're like, I'm just like into bodyweight exercise. Like, okay, so pull-ups, right? They're like, I want to do as many pull-ups as possible. Like, I gotcha. My first recommendation is, have you ever done weighted pull-ups? And about half the time, they're like, well, I don't use weight on my pull-ups. Yes, I know you don't use weight, but you should be using weight because it'll make the, the regular pull-ups that much easier. Have you encountered that? When you give people advice in, in calisthenics, they sometimes are like, oh, I have to go to the gym or, oh, I have to buy a weight belt. Have you ever gotten pushback on that? Uh, totally, because, you know, like you mentioned, excellent point that people, uh, and that's why I wanted to specify really, uh, I wanted to really specify what is calisthenics and what we are talking about today because sometimes it's just, you know, people look at that as the substitute for weight training. So if you want to, so you either do, and people always uh, get very stuck, like very emotionally bonded to the style of training. I mean, yes. for example, they think that, you know, lifting weights will make them bulky and this is not the type of strength that you need in calisthenics, which is obviously not true because... Uh, <laughs> The strength, you know, like you, you strength all, is strength. All, this yeah. is not the same the same muscle that you would build with calisthenics. Things like that are actually pretty common in calisthenics, uh, like communities. Uh, hopefully, it's gonna get better and better. Because that's already a thing, you'll see the top guys that win most things are gonna be using more and more and more technology, more lifting, more nutrition, and then everyone else is just gonna kind of catch on. Like it used to be with CrossFit people just trained in their garages or trained at the CrossFit box. They just did the regular workouts. After five years of CrossFit competition, everyone was doing periodized training because that's how you become a champion. There's almost no CrossFitters now who just show up to the regular class yeah. and go, I'll just do this class. They're like, okay, well, that's not going to really make you that much better. So I think that hopefully in calisthenics, we'll move into that direction. Yes, I, I believe in that. And that's one of, you know, the goals with uh, my channel as well is to just educate people uh, the best I can uh, and provide the knowledge that they can apply to the calisthenics. Um, so, so yeah, so I just, you, you touched upon the, the 40 pull-ups, which is honestly kind of like a mystery to me because uh, I can read a lot uh, and I've been reading your books and kind of trying to transfer this knowledge into, you know, building, for example, one rep maxes in calisthenics, building skills in calisthenics, was reading about, you know, like the um, the SRA curves the and everything. And the thing is, I could not, I could not um, still get the answer of how to periodize training for example periodize you know like split to the phases um when we want to get to let's say 50 pull-ups and we want that muscular endurance which is totally totally different topic than you know like building uh one rep max hypertrophy even so let me specify certain things like with the skill training and then i'm gonna uh, give you the voice as as we already did so the thing with the pull-ups let's say let's take this example of pull-ups. So there are a couple of problems here. Uh, most people that are training for this kind of goal, for this kind of endurance set, uh, will just be adding reps, like you, like you mentioned before, which is not the most optimal way to do it. Uh, but there is the reason they do it. Uh, they, for example, if you trained for barbell press uh, and you would want to get to 50 reps with uh, 50 kilos. You can just reduce the weight and train these numbers, right? Like yes. 50, 40. Uh, yes. But in case of pull-ups, you are forced to decrease the specificity. So you have to either use bands, which will, you know, uh, decrease differently. Yeah, force curve. Yeah, the force curve change it um, a bit. Uh, also, you have machines, but they will, you know, slightly change it. And sometimes some people have the access to the pulleys that can you know provide the same res assistance throughout the movement but i don't think that it's a common uh, thing to have like most people will not have the access to it um so my question to you is how would you go about uh, training and periodizing for this kind of uh athlete so someone goes to you and want to learn 50 pull-ups you know like he's been training strength uh, and building muscle. He's been cycling through hypertrophy, strength, then some active rest, then hypertrophy, strength, something like that. 
and he wants to introduce the endurance. Um, how how would you do it? Yeah. So I think a very easy answer, and I'll, I'll make sure to caveat this appropriately and link it into the big picture. Okay. Is to train with specificity. And there's no very unique way. Because let's let's say you're currently doing 35 pull-ups as your maximum, and you want to do 40 pull-ups as your maximum. Well, you know when, however you trained before in months and months before, we could get into that. We kind of already did. Uh, the weeks leading up to your attempt at 40 should be characterized by probably uh, an increase in repetitions uh, in the range in which you are capable. So let's say last year you did 35, peaked. And now you can reliably do at least one set of 35 with like three reps in reserve. So the way you would do that is you would do multiple sets, plenty of rest between them, and you know two or three times a week. And your top set, you know your best first set, would be like start at 35, but that's three reps in reserve, so no big deal. And then you could do next week 36, and then next week you could do 37, and then 38, and that's really hard. Deload, do some technical practice with you know just a few pull-ups here and there, and then compete or show off and try to hit that big 40. That's a pretty good idea because you're within range to hit that. Now, if you're more than five or 10 reps off of your goal, you're probably suffering from one of two things. One, major strength deficiency, and two, a major muscle size deficiency. Because local muscular endurance doesn't have an enormous window of adaptation. Once, you know, after several weeks of training, it's about as good as it's going to get. The muscle has to get bigger or you have to get nervous system technically better and stronger at pull-ups. So if you are in a position where you've been at between 33 and 35 pull-ups for a year and you just doesn't go up any higher, first of all, maybe you're at your best you'll ever do. Unlikely, but that's possible. But the other thing is you should probably work on doing sets of 10 or sets of 20 with more weight. Try to put more weight on the bar slowly. For example, if when you were doing 33 pull-ups, you could do pull-ups with 20 kilos for a set of 10, work over months and months or weeks and weeks at least to get to 25 kilos for a set of 10. When you get back into the specific training of higher repetitions, oh, you're almost certainly going to do more than 33 because you're just the underlying basis is, is better. Hypertrophy work, same idea, even though that really is hypertrophy work we just talked about, gaining a little bit of weight, putting on some muscle. Then once you lose fat again and you have your string you know, of preparation several months before you really want to show off, start incorporating more and more high rep efforts, pushing it closer and closer to those reps. There's alternate ways as well. You can, so so when you're pushing closer and closer to those reps, some of the days you'll have five kilos on and you'll hit like, like if your goal is 40, you might hit like 32 or 31 or 33 with five kilos on you. And then other days you might uh, want to work on, for example, forearm endurance because, you know, for high rep pull-ups after a while, yeah. shit hurts and everything sucks. Yeah. You might want to do a situation where you do assisted pull-ups or pulley pull-ups and you do very high degrees of time under tension, including hangs and the pull-ups itself to condition your forearms for that event. So you're coming up under it and you're coming up over it, but most of the training is still more reps, more reps, more reps, and then everything tapers, you compete and it's all great. It's just that people think you can just go from a set of, you know, uh, 10 pull-ups maximum to a set of 30 pull-ups maximum just by adding a rep every week. That's that's the acute strategy that should be saved for the end for the last several months at most, probably like, a, you know, four to eight weeks is when you should be adding reps at the top of your maximum effort. But if you can only do 10 pull-ups and you want to do 30 eventually, you probably have a muscle size problem and a strength problem. So okay. for years and years, you should be doing like if, and this is an honest to God truth, if I wanted to eventually be able to do 40 pull-ups, what I would, granted my joints were healthy, what I would do is try to get to a point where with like ooh, 10 to 30 kilos on me, I could do a fuckload of pull-ups, like 10 or 15. That's a hell of a basis in muscularity and strength to now try a little bit more of the high rep stuff. And look, if you can do 10 pull-ups with 30 kilos hanging, 
I mean, you're doing 20, no problem with no weight hanging. And all of a sudden you're that much closer to 30. And then, and then it's just wiggling. So, so yes, you do add reps and reps and reps, but that's only for the last 48 weeks. Before that, you need to work in the rep ranges that best correspond to hypertrophy, which doesn't happen to be sets of 40 probably, um, or muscular endurance at the top end, which is something you should worry about only sort of, so really just hypertrophy and strength. So you can do sets of three to six with heavy weights. You can do sets of oh, 10 to 20 with lighter weights, alternate that. And as those numbers go up every month, you can test how many pull-ups you can do. And almost certainly every month it's going to go up, 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 but just don't do the actual pull-ups themselves because with staleness, that becomes an untenable way to gain strength. Yeah, so you kind of like opened my eyes on that because I thought that uh, it's going to be some kind of, you know, like um, hybrid type of training when you do like one endurance set or you just modify the intensity in the first, you know, like sets uh, and then go to your normal like kind of pull-ups. But, uh, but yeah, but it actually makes a lot of sense to do it this way. So... Um, so thank you for the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. When when it comes to the uh, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is kind of related, um, but many times in calisthenics and there are different examples, but uh, there are elements or moves that we want to learn to do one rep of. Let's take the example. I think is going to be most applicable: the handstand push-up, the freestanding handstand push-up. Just and one rep. Yes, just one rep. And um, the goal then is not going to be uh, be adding more weight to this handstand push-up, but just doing more reps. But we want to build up to one uh, handstand push-up. So the problem with a lot of calisthenic skills and this one and pull-ups, uh, but I just wanted to specify for the handstand push-up this time, uh, is that there are no real ways to just decrease the resistance and practice the same movement pattern. So there are a couple of ways to do it, to to, to decrease the, the difficulty, we would say, of this exercise. And I wanted to uh, I wanted you to state your opinion of which is the most effective in your eyes or sure. which are just, you know, like it's good to choose them over some other ones. Sure. So I'm going to mention them right now. So, for example, we can do partial reps uh, of handstand push-ups. Uh, this will work. Uh, so handstand push-up is kind of like the ascending curve. So as we go, you know, like down, uh, it's going to get harder. So we yes. can use that to build progressively the range of motion, use like P, P ROM method or something. This is one thing, uh, which I think was used even like uh, back in some days, you know, with overhead pressing. I think that this story of like progressive range of motion is actually with the overhead press. Um, so that's one one thing. The second is doing negatives. So doing only eccentric phase, you know, so getting up, doing eccentric. So we get the full range of motion here. We don't get the the concentric, but, you know, it's one of the options. The second would the, the third would be introducing uh, some sort of uh, pauses. So maybe, you know, just stopping at some point, uh, stuff like that. Uh, but it's going to be related to the to the negatives as well, so to the eccentrics. Um, next, we can try to use partner or we can try to assist ourselves and somehow go through the whole range of motion, but probably, probably reduce the specificity this way because we don't have this exact pattern. Someone is yeah. helping us. Uh, someone is helping us, we are help helping ourselves, you know, we are doing like pike push-ups where we have like legs on something, Yeah. we do this exercise. So we reduce the specificity, but we can go through full range of motion and reps. Yeah. Um, so uh, these are kind of like the things in, in, ca in, in case of handstand push-up, we can use those. And um, how would you go about things? Uh, would you use mm -hmm. everything or maybe there are some better options of them? I have two more. You can use all those. I have two more. One is you can launch yourself using your legs. So if you're upside down, 
you go huh, like that and you press out at the same time. Does that make sense? So you yes, basically yes, your yes, legs are talking, yes. you go huh, like that. So that's, so that's really yeah. correct. And, and so that you can, the cool thing about momentum is you can use a variable amount. You can be like, all right, I just want one rep and I just need momentum as much as possible. Or you get to the point where you can, can't do one strict rep, but you may be able to do five reps with like a limited amount of momentum. Right, so that's a really good one. And the real big benefit of that one is that it allows you to train your balance. Uh, because you're on your own, your partner's not holding you. That's the big downside with partner holding, yes. is you can focus on the strength without worrying about the balance. The thing is, that is by far the worst one of them, because if you want to focus on strength, just go to the gym and do shoulder presses. Okay, that's better for strength anyway. So the partner holding thing starts to come apart a little bit. So if you can use your own momentum, that's a really, really good idea because it allows you that balance stuff. Training method number two is this. Uh, get into the bottom position, for example, and just on your head and your hands at the same time, you should be able to comfortably hold that, gee, for like at least 30 seconds, okay? And your feet are going to be doing this, and you're going to try to stabilize them. Then you can make it progressively harder that you're going to move your feet back a little bit and see if you can save yourself and then move forward a bit see if you can save yourself side to side feet like this all the different stuff what you're doing there is using that as skill training you are very comfortable in this position and you're comfortable balancing yourself now all you have to do is you can literally just do two things you can use that shit on one training day and the other training day overhead work for strength and then as your overhead work becomes strong enough one of these days you're just gonna be like that was easy because okay. the balance stuff you've already been doing. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it. Ideally, you would use a lot of stuff. Again, the downside of the short range of motion stuff is it is actually a violation of specificity. It's a very different movement going here than it is going from here to here. So that being said, you could incorporate all of those things. But I think the real big challenge of the handstand push-up is the balance. If it was just the strength, it would be the simplest problem of all time. The balance is a big deal, and your overhead press doesn't train that basically at all. So I would do lots of overhead pressing and overhead tricep extensions and all this other kind of stuff. To and you, those numbers have to be going up. Like if you weigh, you know, seventy-five kilos, and you can do seventy-five for ten on the overhead press, yeah, you're going to be going overhead no problem soon. And then you ask the question, why can't I do it yet? It's usually a balance and a specificity thing. Yes. Just standing in that position, getting comfortable, maybe rocking up a little bit, rocking up, so doing some partials, and also doing those drills where you let your feet go too far this way, too far that way, oh, oh, and you save it, and you save it side to side. After a while, your balance is so good that if you push as hard as you can and you get off balance, you've been in that position 50 times. It's no problem to save it at all. So like one of the things you look at is gymnasts, for example, can do like fucking a trillion of these things. Are they really strong? Not really, but they're very strong for their body weight. Nothing crazy, nothing powerlifter like. So then why can't powerlifters do but a few of them? Because they don't have the practice with balance. That's the big deal. So if you can find a way that trains the balance by itself, because it's not very fatiguing, you can actually do it more often. Like I know, I've known people to try to work on their headstand, uh, their headstand press, and um, they the ones that were successful, typically the ones that like, I was a little bit obsessed, but every few hours they'll get on the wall and just hold it just right there and they'll move their feet, move them back. And they're so used to that movement that by the time it comes time for them to try this, they might have been doing some parcels already, some momentum foot launches. And then if you do, like if you do five momentum foot launches and successfully extend every time, take a break for two days and just try to push up and it's easy because all of a sudden, you know, you're used to all those elements. So increasing the strength should be a separate thing done in the gym and increasing your capacity for maintenance of balance and specificity should be another separate part. A lot of those other things you mentioned are somewhere between the two. So they're totally great to use for variation, but we have to keep in mind that we have to keep going. The problem is a lot of people would just do one or two of those things. They would say, okay, I want a bigger, you know, I want to be able to headstand push up, then I'm just going to use gym equipment and just get a big overhead press. Yes, but that's not training the specificity and the balance. On the other hand, some people, probably in the calisthenics community, your weights are stupid. I'm not a gym lifter. I'm going to use everything I can but weights. They get really good at the balance component, but they meet just their shoulders just aren't big enough. And a lot of times, the people who are most vocal in the calisthenics community are the ones that are genetically blessed and they already have, they're already jacked, they grow weight. The real, if you're a good calisthenics coach, 
you can show yourself up by coaching girls, for example, or guys that just don't have the greatest genetics. If you can get a girl to do multiple reps in a headstand push-up, holy shit, you know something. And for those folks, like you're saying you're coaching a girl, they got to have separate technique practice and separate in, uh, attempts to increase their strength because those are two quite different modalities you have to attack. So that's kind of something that uh, I really appreciate the answer because um, that's also something I can put into my coaching practice. Um, so the thing that I took away from that is you mentioned that you want to do like uh, there is the stuff in the middle. So, for example, partials and negatives, sure. but you got to use the best tools for like for for the each thing that you want to achieve. So you won't be building the best strength with doing negatives or partials because probably uh, both like the stimulus to fatigue ratio, uh, probably the um, the technical abilities will inhibit the the strength. Um, Absolutely. And on the other hand, just you balance don't... alone. And on the other hand, you want to use uh, if you want to train the technical abilities, you want to use the most specific uh, type of training for that which is going to be just practicing the handstand and you can do that probably more often as well which is uh, which is something i like to do but i've been not thinking about uh before i've been not thinking a lot about this um kind of like uh separation so i've been doing a lot of that in the middle and i think it's a very good point to to put more time into building the separate things yeah. and to just use the middle ones as the kind of like variation Sure. So, which is an sure. excellent point. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Do all three. One one cool thing is you can do is like you put textbooks, uh, but well, on the ground, and then you can practice the positions all the way from lockout, practice balancing, all the way down to here, practice balancing. And you can even, if you're careful, put blocks or textbooks to where you can try to balance below the actual position. And that's really cool because if you can get good balance and good strength to hold yourself below the actual position, once you actually try to do a headstand push-up, you're like, oh, this is easy as shit. So don't forget deficit work as well. Deficit work, especially partials, just like if you start here, just pushing to here, pushing to here, pushing to here, that can also be a really great tool because then the rest of the movement is relatively easy. Okay, okay. Um, so in terms of that, I wanted to also quickly, very quickly, uh, before we move on to another segment, I wanted to ask you about the different exercise, for example, pull-up. Uh, let's say a person is able to do one pull-up and he wants to learn five pull-ups. Uh, so we kind of going to go into more beginner side of things. Uh, so many coaches would use totally different things to get this person to five pull-ups. Some would uh, make them do negatives. Uh, some would make them do band assisted pull-ups. Other would do one or like three sets of like one rep pull-up and then go to like assisted or machine pull-ups or something like that or using cables, you know? Uh -huh. um, some some probably would do partials as well, but it's probably not the most convenient, uh, like uh, common one. So sure. uh, how would you go about learning, uh, teaching to do more pull-ups. Yeah, I would separate it into at least two phases entirely. So if someone can only do one pull-up and they want to do five, so, you know, fundamentally, the stimulus fatigue ratio of or one rep or any partials you can derive from it is absolutely terrible. So just forget that you can do pull-ups at all, I would say. If you could do one pull-up and you could do zero pull-ups, I'm pretty sure I have basically the same training program. Anything up to about five pull-ups is the same training program. And that program at first does not contain pull-ups. What it does contain is a serious attempt to increase the muscularity of the back and the arms while in some cases controlling for body weight. So it also depends on how long the person's time horizon is. If they're significantly over fat, then the easiest way to do five pull-ups is to lose 10 pounds. And <laughs> like a lot of times that's what works, right? But if they're of a normal body composition, let's just say they're just skinny, the big problem they have is they just don't have big enough back muscles and, and arm muscles to propel. And it's not, so like if you're doing lots of singles and, and eccentrics and stuff, you're essentially peaking your technical ability to do pull-ups. But if you can only do one pull-up, you know, technique's not your problem. Like a bunch of 10 year olds can do a pull up and it's not like they have good technique. They just, they're just body weight, strength to body weight ratio is pretty good. So what I would do for several months is lots of assisted pull ups, lots of pull downs, lots of, you know, some rows and things like that, plenty of bicep curls, so on and so forth, rear delt work, face pulls to increase the muscularity of the muscles involved. Then I would take another few months to increase the strength of the muscles involved. 
And that would be, for example, with assisted pull-ups, sets of three to six assisted pull-ups. Now, some way through the mid part of that process, their first couple of sets of three to six reps, they're going to be able to do with regular pull-ups by this point because they're so much muscular and getting so strong. And then towards the end of that process, when they want to show off, we start to use some overload modalities, like they would do pull-ups with a 1.25 kilos hanging off of them, just sets of two or three. Um, and then other times they would be doing, you know, assisted pull-ups with sets of eight or something. And then eventually they would taper and then try as many pull-ups as possible, uh, having trained a few sets of hard, hard pull-ups. And then boom, all of a sudden they can do seven, whereas they could only do one before. But in the meat and potatoes of that basic work was getting their back musculature bigger, uh, people think that spe they, they only see specificity. And it's okay, like, you need to get better at pull-ups, so everything we're going to train you in is going to be some kind of pull-up. Uh, that's not the problem. Uh, you know, the problem fundamentally is a lack of the muscle and the strength to power the pull-up. Like, if someone can do six pull-ups no problem, and they want to do ten... Being able to do six pull-ups makes pull-ups a good strength exercise because you can do sets of three to six. Then yeah. doing 10 is the easiest thing in the world. You have some days in which you try to do as many pull-ups as possible and other days in which you use, uh, you know, five kilos, seven and a half kilos, and you do sets of three to six. And then over time, your ability to do 10 pull-ups just shows up. The problem is you're doing just one pull-up is all those other things, band-assisted pull-ups suck because the force curve is terrible. Partner-assisted work is okay. Eccentrics are okay, but their stimulus to fatigue ratio just isn't that great. I mean, specificity wise isn't that great either because you're learning how to like just do this, which is cool. But what about this part? Who knows? You know, nothing really beats assisted pull-ups in that regard. And assisted pull-ups are as easy as getting like a rope that, that is relatively uh, low friction, putting it over the pull-up bar, tying weights to one end of it, and just tying the other end around your belt or around yourself and just doing assisted pull-ups. So, you know, because at the end of the day, it's really this simple. For strength sports, which is this is a strength sport, um, what is the best repetition range for hypertrophy? The answer is probably about sets of five to ten reps. Okay, that's fact number one. Okay. Go to the person and say, okay, can you do five to ten reps of the pull-up? They go, no. Okay. So why the fuck would we do pull-ups? This doesn't make any goddamn sense. It, it, it's like saying, okay, you want to be the fastest sprinter of all time. Cool. Let me get you in a car going as fast as the fastest sprinter of all time and drop you out of it. See if you could just do this. I, I, what's that for? I don't know. Right? So that's the equivalent of people like putting a person who can't do a pull up at the top of the rung and then they slowly descend. Like that's cool. Psychologically, it's neat because they get to work with their own body weight. Is that the best use of their time? Probably not. I'd much rather put them on a machine in which they can do sets of 10 and then increase that amount of sets of 10 load, which is to say take load off of the machine or just pull downs. Let's say you have a cable pull down. You used to be able to do 100 for sets of 10. Now you can do 130 and your body weight has never changed. Of course you can do more pull ups now. It would be insane if you couldn't. So if you are really that bad at doing pull ups, which is no, no big deal because a ton of people are, then pull ups can be so bad. You're so bad at them that you don't even have the ability to use them uh, as the best possible training modality. Here's another really quick example. What's what's your native language? What's your first language? It's Polish. Polish. Oh, Polsko Guro. Very cool. So, all right. So if someone's trying to learn Polish, if they have a decent conversational Polish, just send in the fuck into Warszawa or Warsaw and just like go walk around, talk to people. That's the best way to train Polish language because you have a working understanding of Polish. Now, if I don't know any Polish, like me, I know like three words, um, I probably need to go to the basics, like a kindergarten class with textbooks and words and pictures. If you can only do one pull-up, you need to go to the pull down and the assisted pull up and all that okay. stuff. You're not ready to use. That makes sense. The same yeah. kind of idea. It's too much. Totally, totally. It's great explanation. Thank you. Um, uh, so yeah, so I wanted to quickly, uh, quickly ask two questions in regards to the uh, funny name street lifting. Uh, I know <laughs> not in regards to the name, but in regards to the sport. So. Uh, you mentioned, for example, in powerlifting, uh, there are three exercises that has different uh, SRA curves, meaning like deadlift, for example, you're probably going to train a bit less uh, frequently than uh, other movements uh, because they're more, more taxing. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how would you go about uh, these four exercises? So, for example, you have pull-up, weighted pull-up, weighted dip, muscle-up, weighted muscle-up, and squat. Out of these four, do you think that there are different frequencies that would be more optimal for 
training in terms of the SRA curve? So which one of them would be more stressful? So first answer is it really depends on the individual. Can they recover at a certain rate? Because I could tell you an average and then someone's like, well, my dips don't recover that fast. You're like, okay, well, they'll only do them as fast as they recover. My first guess, so of course squatting has to have at least some load management because you can't go heavy all the time. You might actually be able to do heavy dips like every day. Heavy pull-ups, you might be able to do twice a day. Uh, heavy squats, you may be able to do once a day for a while until you break in half and you can't do it anymore. My So, so squats definitely have that constraint. The muscle up is probably pretty constraining because of the transition here. Yes. Really taxes your glenohumeral joint. Um, I would say, and, and here's another interesting thing. The, there's a technical ability to heavy muscle ups, the transition, right? That's important to train both on its own, just with technique work, and at appropriately heavy loads because it feels different. But the muscle up really is just composed of the pull up and the dip after that. So if you train pull ups and dips really hard and just mostly do technical work for muscle ups, you can do occasional strength work for muscle ups, but it keeps going up because your pull up and dip training is so helpful to that, right? Yes. Like if you if a genie magically lets you do 100 more kilos in the dips, your if your muscle ups are limited by how much you can push off, oh my God, it's just increased by like 30 kilos or something. If you are really bad at the pull up part and you can dip a lot, if you improve your pull up, your muscle up is going up for sure because you're going to enter this phase like, whoa, holy shit, fly off yeah. the bar or some shit like that. So because of this kind of two factor constraint, one, dips and pull ups already take care of maybe 80% of our muscle up training by themselves. And two, muscle ups may not be amazing for the joints all the time. It means maybe half of your muscle up sessions, you can do just technical practice, like standing on a chair or some kind of like machine that offloads you, or maybe even a pulley system and just working on the transition here from different angles and stuff like that, or working on the push off, push off. So that can be half the training and the other half can be traditional heavy sets of five or whatever, actual heavy full muscle ups. But that should probably not be a lot of training because fundamentally the strength of the muscles is really mostly just the same. If you do dips plus pull-ups, which you should be anyway, the muscle-ups don't have to be done as frequently. So I would say pull-ups pretty high frequency, dips pretty high frequency, squats moderate frequency, or maybe heavy and light session interspersed, and then muscle-ups probably the lowest frequency, but lots of technical work interspersed with high with the, uh, the super intense stuff. Yeah, okay, totally get it. I honestly expected this kind of answer uh, but it's awesome to 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 get like this clarified. Um, sure. So yeah. So when it comes to uh, the street lifting, I had one uh, one more question. However, I think that I'm gonna uh, take like different question. So I wanted to ask you, mm, in terms of the uh, let's say mm, someone is doing isometrics. So like static holds, right? It's pretty common in calisthenics. It's pretty specific type of practice uh, for certain elements. Um, how would you approach your volume landmarks in terms of isometrics? So for example, reps in reserve, how, what would be the equivalent to one rep in reserve? How would you, you know, like about obviously, uh, yeah. seconds in reserve. Uh, or how would you call, like what would you call the set that is count, you know, like, uh, counted into the volume that can be counted uh how many sets is it the same or is it a bit different uh or in terms of like the maximal hold that you can that you can do that you know uh, i wanted to ask you yeah if you have some yeah. idea on that the basics are the same the actual applied numbers are completely different so how many static holds equates to how many sets of let's say you know, uh, dips or something. If your static hold is like, you know, top of a dip position or something, no clue. It's a different person to person, but it's up to the person to figure out what their own volume landmarks are. The good news is it's pretty easy to figure out. If you do a certain number of static holds per week and you're not getting any better, that's below your minimum effective volume. It just is. It's just not getting any better. If you do more of them or do them harder, you start to experience benefits and improvement. And then at some at some point you do so many of them that you get really tired, your performance gets worse. That's your maximum recoverable volume. So those are really easy to find just by trial and error. Yes. As far as RIR, it's actually very easy. Seconds in reserve. Now, one second doesn't necessarily equal one RIR, okay? But you're going to find a, a level at which the set is challenging, okay? So the first thing you have to do 
is probably, maybe not first, but ideally you would have a training history and you know, okay, in this isometric position, my best time is one minute. That's my all-time best. Then I fell and I almost broke my head and that was it. That was, that was failure. And then you need to figure out what is a challenging amount of time. So if you do 30 seconds, are you honestly challenged? You're like, no, that's easy as shit. I could do that all day. When do you really start to feel the shakes and be like, oh shit, okay, this is this is real. Because when it feels real, that's when the training effect starts to present itself. So maybe that's the answer is 50 seconds. Okay, so you'll do 50 seconds and you know how, how many reps you do doesn't, or sorry, how many sets you maybe do a set of 50, then a set of 47, then a set of 45, and then a set of 42, and then you're done for that day or something like that. So you can always mm -hmm. do more sets, just probably make them a little easier to make the relative effort the same. And so maybe you start week one, doing a static hold with 50 seconds and then in week two push it a little bit go to 52 and then go to 54 the week after and then you know so on and so on and then maybe you can finish that cycle at a minute and two seconds holy shit pr so that um what i really advise against is not tracking the time and just kind of going until you fail falling off and just assuming that process will take care of itself it will, but it's not the most efficient process of training. For one reason is because emotionally hitting a true PR is hard, especially when you're really good. And most of your training can be beneficial even if it's submaximal. So if your all-time best hold is a minute long, don't just try to hit a minute every time. Try to hit, you know, whatever's challenging. Let's say it's 50 seconds. And then over time, week to week to week, put more time and more time and more time. If you get fatigued, deload, and then start that process over again. So maybe you started at 52, and then you got to 58, and then you were too beat up, and you had to deload. Next time, you might start at 54, and then you get up to a minute, and it's a PR, but it's the PR very fatigued at the end of a training cycle. It's a really good thing. Next mesocycle, you might start at 56 and end up at a minute three, and that's a three-second PR. That's amazing, and the entire time it was organized and progressive. Sometimes, especially in static holds, mentally, it's a very difficult to clue in, to continue to hold, even when the rest of your body says, I'm dying, stop doing this. You have right. to have objective value goals you have to hit. Today, I am hitting 52 seconds. And if you can't hit 52 seconds, it's time for a deload because you're too fatigued. And then the next time come back, 52 seconds. Okay, it wasn't that terrible. Next time it's 54. And you go 54, 56, blah, 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 or in three seconds, whatever you figure out, three second, two second, one half second increments, doesn't matter. It just needs to be able to hop to get harder and harder over time. And then when you can't make it any harder, two sessions in a row or dog shit, you're too tired, deload, it's time to relax. Then you restart that process. Over time, you'll pass your old PR and then you'll be off in the wind. So, uh, yeah, so in, it's interesting, uh, the seconds in reserve. Uh, so like you mentioned, probably one second is not one rep in reserve. It's not like equivalent, but uh, it's, it's like you mentioned, it's something that we should figure out on our own in yeah. terms of like the relative intensity of the sets. Yes, between when it gets very challenging and when you can't do it anymore. That's where all your good training happens. Okay. So all you have to do is, you already know what you can't do anymore, it's your previous PR, and then you gotta start with like, okay, honestly, when is it tough? And you don't wanna go like, there's no bonus points for getting real tough. You just have to be honest, it has to be hard enough. Maybe it's 45 seconds, maybe mm -hmm. it's 50. Start there and then week after week after week go to here and you might even pass this without notice. Yeah, so for example, I would establish something like that when you start experience some sort of, you know, like shaking, yes. uh, that's when that's when it starts to get like enough intense relatively. Um, yes. Okay, so I wanted to ask a very interesting question uh, that I've been kind of, you know, like trying to, to answer myself. Um, so as you know, in calisthenics, as in gymnastics, a very popular tool, tool are the gymnastics rings. Uh, you mentioned that uh, instability is not uh, something that we desire in the hypertrophy training. Yeah. Uh, so doing squats on possible is probably not the best way to build you know, your quads. There are better ways to do it. Uh, but let's say that we have a person that lives you know, like somewhere and has only the access to gymnastics rings. And he wants to build his chest. Uh, and normal push-ups kind of start getting uh, you know, like easy. So he kinds of start doing 60, 70, which goes, you know, like beyond the, 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 the intensity that we would desire for hypertrophy training. So would you rather go and make this person utilize the gymnastics rings and do the, the push-ups on the rings 
in spite of their instability or uh, do for example variations of one arm push up uh, where oh. the instability is not present but we are only you know like increasing maybe the less Mm -hmm. So, what is the goal of this person? What do they want? Do they want a big chest? Or? They want big chest, yeah. The biggest and chest gymnastics, And they have only gymnastics rings. Should they utilize them? That's the question, basically. I'm gonna cheat. I'm a che I'm a cheat the fuck out of this answer. You're gonna hate me. You're gonna kick me off your podcast. I'm never coming back. So the real answer is, you make the you use the rings, and you can also use one arm push ups potentially. Although I think that's rather rather unstable itself. Um, okay. If you want a bigger chest. You use the rings, but you modify the exercise to make it much more difficult than a regular push-up. So not normal push-ups on gymnastics rings is this, have them try do this. And then when they get really good, sets of 20 for this, have them do ring flies. Have you ever done a ring fly with your body weight? Holy Very shit, shit, that is hard. And it's easy too to progress because you could do ring flies with your feet pretty close to your body. And then as you get really good, you get your feet out. You can even elevate your feet on some kind of platform or a, a stack of books. If I see someone who can do their body weight completely flat to the rings, so their, their feet on books, completely flat, which should be easy for a calisthenics guy, and a full range of motion ring fly like this for a set of 10 i motherfucker got the biggest chest in the whole world <laughs> so you can get a pretty unbelievable chest at home just with rings you just have to widen it and maybe arc it out do some variations and all of a sudden you got a great tool here's another one you can do supersets so let's say what you could do you can even do tr like tri sets so check this out you do five of these, okay, and you get real close to failure, then you switch to really deep outside ring push-ups. Maybe you can get five and it's almost done, and then you go to just normal push-ups, and then you toss the rings away, number four, and you go to the ground and just do regular push-ups. Oh my God, that's four approaches to failure in one set. Now, of course, the volume landmarks for that are gonna be much lower. That might be a whole workout or just do two of those in a whole chest workout, but there's no, if you can switch. So the cool thing about rings is this, if you just have the floor, how the fuck are you going to do flies? <laughs> you're just going to hug the floor and then do this? It doesn't move anywhere. <laughs> but if you have rings, you're opening up a huge potential to get really strong. One caveat is careful because you can hurt yourself. Be very slow in the descent. Pause at the bottom. Don't spring out of the shit. Pause and then a very slow concentric. And that can be a really, really powerful weapon. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh during your answer, I made a decision not to kick you off the podcast yet. Um, I'm trying to get kicked off. It's not working. Yeah. So I think that we're going to get, you know, like 10 to 15 minutes more um, still in spite of that answer. Uh. <laughs> and yeah. So um, so the question that I have for you right now is um, regarding... I actually have three more questions. Sure. Uh, so we've been mentioning that a lot today, but I wanted to specifically ask about the RPE or reps in reserve, the relative intensity during our strength phase in calisthenics. So let me explain the problem. Uh, when it comes to powerlifting, our goal is maxing out in the certain movements. So we need to kind of learn the ability of uh, maxing out, of grinding, right? So let's say one rep max squat. We have to practice that in sure. the strength phase but we on the other hand want to reduce the fatigue as much as we possibly can now in calisthenics we don't have this issue because we don't have to uh, learn the ability of grinding uh, we we just want to learn one rep of let's say certain exercise and then make it even more beautiful by perfecting form or increasing the reps of it so we don't want to grind it's not our purpose um, so my question is should we just go with low uh, RPEs in case of um, like strength exercises, specific strength exercises? Give me an example and, of an exercise. Okay, so let's say that uh, I want to learn uh, the one arm chin up. And uh, I'm going to do a very specific variation. So, for example, like holding here or something or using the, a band. The cheating one arm pull up. The cheating one arm pull up, yeah, it's actually a pretty good method. It's pretty specific. Like we've been studying it uh, before, uh, it is. Um, so let's say someone is using this progression, 
and um, he finds out that you know uh, after getting to high RPE, uh, so let's say to zero one zero reps in reserve, the form is starts kind of like getting harder. The the fatigue is increasing. The connective tissue is kind of like uh, risky. So. Should we just go with, let's say, three reps in reserve in this exercise, practice that, you know, like the technical elements and the strength uh, in that range, since we don't want to learn the, the grinding, and just go then with some conventional exercise like chin-ups, weighted chin-ups for the higher RPEs, or even reduce that since it's a strength phase and we want to like kind of reduce the fatigue? Yeah, maybe. But at the end of the day, if you are really want to show off how many one arm pull ups you can do, you're going to have to grind, right? Like if you're at a competition, it's grinding. So you have to get used to the grinding anyway. Okay. Does that mean you have to grind in training all the time? Probably not. Start at like three RIR, seven RPE, whatever. It's just seven RPE is a convenient one because it might be two or three reps. And then slowly add reps or add load until you are doing close to zero or one and here's the thing if your joints are bothering you at that point can you stop and deload totally the other alternative is if you stop at one rir you have to have a good reason to do it because if you stop a progression at one rir and go back down deload and go back down somebody could ask you hey so i noticed you got five reps and one arm pull-ups last time yeah i did this was that all you could do you're like nah, i think i could have done a six okay why didn't you do a six you're like uh because it was gonna be too much like, why because if you don't have my joints hurt how do you know you couldn't have done six with one rir how do you know you couldn't have done a seventh one you really don't until you test things occasionally going very close to failure or to failure really gives you the most objective possible data on if you are not trying hard enough and some people aren't trying hard enough so in a situation like that i would start at seven rp and regularly, every mesocycle, I'd probably work up to 10 RPE of just a maximum effort and see if you can't improve that. And if you go next week and your effort is down, you're too fatigued, it's time to deload. So the progressions of putting more load or more reps need a reason to stop. Because if you don't stop for a reason, someone could say, why did you just stop? You could have kept going. If you're like, look, every time I get to the high of RP, my elbows flare up, that's a great reason. That's all you need. And then you can stay between three and two RIR all the time. Just make sure you're progressing in difficulty until that progression would be too much for your joints. But for most people, probably many people, they can grind no problem, just not all the time. Once a month, once every two months, because progressively doing more and more will eventually result in grinding. And that grinding tells you you're trying hard enough. Because otherwise, you could just be kind of shitting yourself. Like someone could tell you, look, I can't really do my three, my seven RPE is four pull ups. And then one day you're just like, let's do this, man. Let's just get as many pull ups as you can do. And all of a sudden, they can, they just did 11. And you're like, you fucking liar. They're like, well, it felt hard. Well, no shit, but you've training outside of your beneficial range this entire time. So unless you get to the point where grinding at least starts to start, and you can stop after that. If you ne if you always stop short of a grind, you never can tell if you're training hard enough because RPE can be a thing that sneaks up on you or it could be way far away from you and you'd have no idea. So we, we just cannot predict the RPE without testing it actually. Not reliably, um, especially in low rep sets of several you know movements that especially with high technical movements, your technique could have gotten a lot better. And actually your RPE is much lower than you thought it was. You're just like, well, there's no way I can do two more reps. Like turns out there is. It, grinding isn't a big problem. It's only a big problem if you do it all the time. But if at the end of a progression you get into a grind, hey, like then you can always back off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your opinion on the quite popular method uh, in calisthenic circles, at least it's been that way, uh, which is the greasing in groove. I don't know if you're familiar with this method. It's oh yeah. If you are, then yeah. uh, please, if you could just state your opinion on that. Uh, in case of someone wants to learn a skill or someone wants to learn, probably the answers are gonna be different. Uh, strength, you know, uh, given skill, that is more technical and build muscle, which yeah. is 
I expect what is the answer, but yeah. Sure. But would like you to explain, yeah. Sure, sure. So the Gracian Groove method is what I wouldn't really consider a method, it's just a fractional part of overall good practice. There's the fundamental the principle of SRA, which is what this method is a subcomponent of, states that you know every quality you have, including your technical qualities, endurance qualities, hypertrophy, and strength, they have a certain amount of necessary work you have to do to stimulate gains, and a certain time course after which you can do another high-quality workout. So what greasing the groove does is it keeps the volume low enough, and oftentimes the relative effort low enough, so that you can get a very high frequency amount of work in, which matches the SRA curve of technique really well. Strength, not so great. Hypertrophy, decently. So it ends up being a very fine method of training. There is a better method of training called modern periodization, where you have a week of training. Let's say Greasing the Groove has you train seven times in that week. Yes. No problem. We'll do six. Two of the workouts are going to be super fucking heavy. Right? And that because strength takes the longest to recover from. So Monday, Thursday, ultra heavy. Uh, Tuesday, Friday is going to be higher volume for hypertrophy because that doesn't take as long to recover from. And you can also do it when you're pretty tired from heavy work. And then two of the other workouts, Wednesday and Saturday, are going to be what you would normally call greasy and groove, which is to say like relatively easy, just a few sets, relatively light load, just for practice, for technical practice. Now you're training six times a week, not seven, or let's say it's both six, but instead of every workout kind of being the average of all of those, the workouts are specific. You're getting two amazing strength sessions, two amazing hypertrophy sessions, which by the way, also give you all the technique work you need. And because it would be overkill to do all those, you have the technique sessions, and here's here's the big point of this. A lot of people try one of these at a time. And they try to fill in all the days like this. Let's let's call it. Let's invent another method. You and I call the strength method, or we'll call it the fuck you method. And be like, what's the fuck you method? It's like you go hard and heavy every time you get to train. I got you. Okay. So realistically, SRA being what it is, you might be able to pull that off three days a week. And then someone will say, man, it works great for me. And someone to say greasing the groove method, they're like, you know, greasing the groove also worked really well for me. I train that six times a week, but it's never really that hard, right? Who wins? Well, they're two extremes. Why not do some measure of both of them? It's like someone's like, pasta's the way to eat. Someone's like, no, it's rice. And someone's like, it's cereal, you idiot. Why not do one day of one, one day of another, one day of another? You get all the benefits, all the variation, and everything comes together. So at the end of the day, you have to arrange your training in such a way as to train as hard as possible, as often as possible, and admit when you cannot train that hard because you're not recovered, and ask yourself, okay, I'm not recovered to do a full-on strength workout, which would be ideal. I mean, it's by far the most specific, right? Like, you want to be stronger if you can i give you a magical steroid that let you do maximum strength workouts twice a day of course you'd fucking take it because you could just be like greasing the groove my ass i'm fucking shooting a cannon every day like i'm just like the strongest person ever but you can't do that so you say okay can i stick in some hypertrophy work yeah you can actually benefit which is the second best way of training because it gives you technique and hypertrophy and mm -hmm. the strength one gives you direct strength and probably hypertrophy and technique but then you say okay i'm training four days a week now I can either just do nothing, which most people do, which is stupid, or I say, ooh, but let's do a little grease in the groove. Can I do strength? Nope, too fucked up. Can I do hypertrophy? Nope, too fucked up. Can I just do technique? Yes. So then you have two days of technique, and that way you're training somehow every single day of the week, six days, but only as hard as you can and are able to recover from. So that is the big difference between high-level athletics and sort of junior league bullshit programs is high-level athletes train in the way that they can, usually when they can. High-level sprinters, they don't sprint maximum all the time. That's insanity. So when they're too sore or too tired to sprint maximally, they'll go lift weights. And when they're too sore, too tired from lifting weights and sprinting maximally, they'll do positional drills where they lift their knee up really high or do some flexibility stuff or work on their running patterning or coach through the breathing. And then they're always doing something and it all adds up, adds up, adds up, adds up. So because the greasing the groove method is great, but the big downside against it is like it, it doesn't train you hard enough in any one session to give you the best possible result. So it works really well for beginners because they have the most technique requirement and it works pretty well for intermediates because it's a lot of work after all. But for very advanced people, greasing the groove might not work that well because every single, here's the minimum uh, minimum intensity of adaptation 
every single recent groove workout is just underneath that. At some point, you got to do crazy shit to get better. So everyone can have all that stuff by doing the crazy when you can, and when you can't, doing the easier, and when you can't, doing the easier, and then everything recovers, and you go back at it again. So I just did a bit like, because I kind of like explained this exact concept. Uh, I mean that it's a bit under the like uh, adaptive, you know, like it's below the threshold that is going to be in cause enough stimulus. I yeah. included this in my like next video, which is like, I don't have to change it. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, I have honestly just last question since we get to one and a half hour of this podcast. So last question uh, is going to be, uh, obviously, we know how uh, important our supplements, uh, at least in our heads, when it comes to strength and performance and everything. Uh, so there are some, probably some supplements that calisthenics athletes could use. Uh, and the one that uh, comes to my mind that is a bit controversial is the creatine. Because as we know, it's gonna increase our body weight a little bit. Uh, at the same time, it's gonna add uh, the strength uh, a little bit as well, you know? Uh, so it's obviously a minor thing, like every supplement, but how would you go about things when it comes to calisthenics athlete? Would you recommend him to use creatine or not, or, get, or use it in certain periods specific? Great question. I have luckily a very intricate answer. So number one is like with almost everything we've talked about, the calisthenic athlete has to try out creatine. So, and this can't be, I, I did it for two weeks and I gained weight and then I couldn't do my lifts and it sucked. Yes. So during a hypertrophy phase or during a strength phase, they should try creatine for months, several months, probably at least two. See how that affects the quality of the training, the rate of adaptation and their acute performance. They may realize that yes, while creatine bloats them, it bloats them inside the muscles and they get two or three more reps and everything. And all of a sudden they're beating their all time PRs. If that's the case, then great. You can keep creatine in during your competitions. So first of all, find out how creatine works for you. Secondly, find out what happens when you pull out your creatine. A week or two after you stop taking creatine, you should lose the bloat, but you'll keep much of the muscle and strength adaptations it caused. And especially in calisthenics, Look, like five days after you stop taking creatine, you weigh two kilos less. Oh my God, you're going to feel like God. You're gonna, Holy yeah. shit, I'm the lightest person ever. So that might happen. Or if creatine gives you a lot of uh, actual local muscular endurance, you may, when you pull out creatine, you may uh, discover no change in performance or you may discover a reduction in performance. Mostly you'll have an increase because of the fact that the body weight is such a big deal. So what I would say is if creatine is something that you respond to well, if it improves the quality of your training, take it and also see how it improves or, or, or detracts from your acute performance. The way you see that is pull it out for two weeks, keep training and see if your training gets better because all of a sudden you weigh two or three kilos less, that can be a huge difference in your training, right? If you find, mo most people will find this, they'll find that when they take creatine, their performance initially gets worse and then tends to flatline and get better back to where it used to be, except they're heavier now. Then most people, when they pull the creatine out, a uh, week to two weeks later, they're going to have a huge spike in body weight performance because your body weight's so much lower and you got all those benefits of creatine. So periodization for those people will be take creatine during strength phases and hypertrophy phases or hypertrophy then strength and then take it through most of your peaking phase and then two weeks out before your competition, drop out creatine. Psychologically, it's going to be sweet because you're going to get an instant boost in body weight mediated performance and it's going to be awesome. Now, if you don't respond to creatine like everyone else, if it actually just makes you better, you want to take it closer to the competition, you want to take it through the competition, but basically try, see how it affects you. At the end of the day, creatine is pretty reliable for putting on muscle and strength, but you have to sacrifice the short-term bullshit. And this is where a lot of people, specifically in calisthenics, get it wrong. They'll take creatine for two weeks. They can do three less dips and two less pull-ups than they used to. And they're like, fuck that, creatine made me weaker. No, it didn't, dumb motherfucker. It added a bunch of body weight to you. But it's actually, we all know very good from research or very well from research that, you know, creatine makes you better. It makes your muscles grow better. It makes your recovery better. Do it for months and months and months. And eventually you're going to get much better. And then the same detraction of performance you had when you started creatine, when you stop creatine, you pull it out, you're going to get a little bump. And if you get that little bump, it's going to be the best of every possible world. 
another big thing or this actually same thing that a lot of athletes don't like to do is to do a lot of their training in suboptimal circumstances, right? They'll say, well, I want to be as, as good as possible every training session. So some calisthenics guys will even go shirtless or with a very small amount of clothing just so they can do more reps. They'll take their shoes off before doing pull-ups. Don't do that in normal training. Save that for the peaking process and maybe even just the competition, but probably the peaking process, like if you normally train in a sweatshirt and pants and shoes and you do as many pull-ups as you can or whatever, then let's say you have a three-week peaking process, go no sweatshirt the first week, no shoes the second week, the third week, try just in whatever, shorts and under, and, and, and a t-shirt, and then all of a sudden, the specificity is perfect, and also, you're lighter, which is psychologically a huge benefit, and you, you're you best at your possible time. So that's a, one of the big resistances to creatine, no doubt, in the calisthenics movement, it's a big resistance in gymnastics, is some people who gain that weight get that initial de decline in performance, but the training to your muscles is still as good as it ever was. It's like magically gaining three kilos of fat and then losing three kilos of fat. It's technically resistance exercise. It's good for you. Yeah. Okay. I totally get it now, uh, which means that uh, we should just periodically use it uh, when it gives us the benefit of that. Um, so uh, before that, I wanted to ask you about how would you count the weight in street lifting? So would you use like the, the, the weight on the belt or the weight of your body full? I know Total the answer right now. Weight. Yes, or, and Total that's the way. question. Uh, okay, so um, I guess I talk the okay word too much. Probably someone is gonna. No, that's okay. That. See, I, I already that's used okay. it. <laughs> that's okay. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. So the last thing is, uh, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this uh, this podcast is gonna uh, be a great knowledge base for every calisthenics athlete that happens to watch it. Uh, it's gonna be definitely be one for me. Uh, and I'm gonna be happy to invite you maybe in a couple of, not maybe years, maybe in a year or something. Sure. And hopefully the calisthenics is gonna be at some higher, you know, like uh, place or it's gonna be a bit more popular in a good way more people are gonna be uh taking for example your books and read them or other sources of knowledge in the strength science so uh do you have some maybe final words with the calisthenics um i see it's thank you so much for having me on i think calisthenics is just a great sport and a great activity it's super healthy it's super awesome and I wish I was good at it. I'm not very good at it. Uh, but um, I think it's awesome. And I think that people, the big message I have is if you care about getting better at something a lot, be smart about it. Learn as much as you can. Learn about sport periodization. You know, periodization was initially developed for athletes like swimmers and volleyball players. It wasn't even developed really for weightlifters. And weightlifters took periodization and made it their own. Um, and just the same way, you know, weightlifting periodization isn't made for for just movement and for calisthenics, but people in calisthenics like yourself can take it and make it their own and just have better results. So that when you, people, maybe you one day, you know, no doubt you'll be a great calisthenics coach and people could come to you and say, how do I get better at pull-ups or dips or whatever? And you don't just have these stupid arrangements of random ideas like, well, this worked for me, do that. You could do better. You say, well, I have a system and there's every reason for every component is justified. That's a real big deal. And I think hopefully the sport is heading in that direction. That's what I, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I try to, you know, educate people for. I try to learn myself. And uh, one of the best things that I, that I have the access to is your work and work of a couple of uh, other people. Uh, so once again, Dr. Mike, thank you so much uh, for this podcast. Uh, great time. And uh, hopefully see you, see you next time. Very cool. Thank you so much.